All right, everyone, let's gather together and let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this beautiful day and uh, the beautiful weather that we're having. And we thank you that you are our God and that you are always with us. We thank you for one another, the fellowship, the camaraderie, and the unity and the support that we get from one another in your, in your family and in your house. So we ask you now that you would allow us to enter into the Holy of Holies to visit you, the Holy One, and that we might, with our praise and our worship, lift all of the angels' voices with us in heaven, that they would join us in the praise and worship that is due to you and to you alone. For you alone are the Holy One. You alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Good morning, brothers and sisters. What a beautiful day is looking out there today, isn't it? Let's begin our time of worship by singing a song that reminds us of the power that the Lord has given us. In 2 Timothy ch uh, chapter 1, we're told, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power. So let us rise and sing this song, Fear Not. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Fear not, for I am with you, says the Lord. about you, but with the passage of time, seeing how the Lord answers prayers, some of them that took years to answer, the more miracles you see, it becomes easier and easier to serve him and notice his sweetness as time grows. Since I started for the kingdom, since my life he controlled, since I gave my heart to Jesus, the longer I serve him, the sweeter. Each day is like heaven 
Continue to lift your name on high this morning. Right, you know this one real well. well let's sing it. Lord, I lift your name on high. I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky lord i lift your name on high lord i lift your name on high lord i love to sing your praises i'm so glad you're in my Glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. You came from heaven. Show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I lift your name on high. Brothers and sisters, let's be seated. It's now time to worship the Lord with our tithes and with our offerings. You may come forward to the offering plates or online. You can go to clintonnazarene.org. You can also use the Church Center app. Look for 
Clinton Nash. the Lord God Almighty reign. prayer time this morning, I would like to um, actually read scripture to you. We're just singing that song. So each of the four living creatures had six wings, and they had eyes that covered all around, inside their wings and outside their wings. And day and night, they never stopped saying before the throne, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was who is and who is to come. Now, whenever these living creatures, cherubim and seraphim, gave glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne and who lives forever and ever, then the 24 elders of men fell down before them who sit on their thrones 
and worship him also who lives forever and ever. And then they cast their crowns down before him, bowing and saying, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they were created, and they have their being. And then if you were to move ahead to the next chapter in chapter 5, there's a thing going on in heaven right after this where they're looking to see who is worthy to open the scroll. And the angels again cry out, worthy are you and you alone to take the scroll and to break open its seven seals for you were slaughtered as a lamb and you purchased people for God from every blood, every tribe, every nation, and every tongue. And you have made them into a kingdom of priests to our God. And they will reign upon the earth with you forever. And then he looks again, and John hears this. Worthy is the lamb from the people who was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And then I heard every living creature say, to him who sits on the throne and to his lamb, be blessing, honor, glory, dominion, and power forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. And now, Kids Connection. to this and I don't usually read from the Bible but this is something this is what we're on and wow God knows how to put everything together we're talking about David still and you know David wrote a lot of our Psalms and he had a lot of emotions just like us sometimes he was sad sometimes he was angry and sometimes he just wanted to praise the Lord and so listen to this. I'm, I'll just read part of it, okay? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise him on the heights. Praise him in all his angels. Praise him all his heavenly hosts. Praise him sun, moon. Praise him all you shining stars. Praise him you highest heaven and you waters above the sky. Let them praise the name of the Lord. And there's praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all ocean depths. Lightning and hail, snow and clouds, stormy winds do his bidding. Right? And it goes on and on and on. And at the end, he has raised up his people, the praise of all the saints of Israel, the people close to his heart. Praise the Lord. Psalm 148. So... Um, it's a theme today, is it not? To praise the Lord. So the thing is, is about David is, I love, you know what I like about him is what I said. He had all the emotions that we do, right? What were some of the things I said? What that he had? He was sad sometimes. What else? Happy. 
mad. Or, yeah, sometimes he had to run. He, he had um, people after him. Sometimes his life really endangered, right? So he had all these things, and he poured out his heart. He always poured his heart out to the Lord. And so today we're talking about praise. Do you remember anything about David? What, what did he do um, like what we call today for a living? Are you? He fought the giant. What did he do for a living? That's true, but but who did he sing them to most of the time? His sheep, good. So uh, he had to keep those sheep calm, right? You know, sheep get kind of, they, they get very, like, skittish. They kind of, yeah, they, they follow each other off into dangerous spots because one goes off. But anyways, so he would sing to them. And then he sang for Saul, right? Remember Saul? I know our Bible quizzing kids know that he would sing for Saul to soothe, right? To soothe him, to make him feel better. <coughs> Excuse me. So the thing to remember is, is that he, he praised God. Even though he had psalms that he was running from people or he was upset, he turns around and he does a praise psalm you know all those beautiful words and I think that's just like us we just need to learn sometimes we go through some hard times some good times and we have to remember Lord no matter what I praise you right so I got a little song I'm going to teach you guys okay so So I learned that song when I was younger than some, probably most of you. But anyways, it's a great song that reminds us all day long, even if we're going through something, we can say, okay, I can praise you, God. Okay, let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you so much for the example of David. I pray that um, you would help us to remember his example and how he, he just poured his heart out to you all the time whether he was upset or happy. Um, I pray that we would remember to do that same thing. Pour our hearts out to you no matter what's going on. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I have announcements. Isn't it wonderful seeing all these kids? I'm just like, it fills my heart with joy. No announcements today. A sweet hour of prayer will be August 14th. Starts at 1030 here. Um, if you'd like to know more about it, you can always uh, talk to Nikki. And we're having our big picnic at the Mason's Farm on August 13th. There's a sign-up sheet outside. So Phyllis really needs to know how many people are going to be there, what you're bringing, so please write down what you're bringing, how many people, um, no bones, she's applying all the meats, so, you know, other stuff, salads, desserts, sides, that kind of stuff. It's a lot of fun, so please join us. Our children's Bible quizzing starts soon, uh, September 6th. 
Um, that's Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5.30, so you know any young children from 6 to 12 who would be interested in that, it's all, it's, they learn so much. Um, the Ignite Homeschool Consortium, that starts t t too, um, September 12th. Um, I think, do we, are you expecting more kids in that, or is that? Public service announcement. Last week I got in the pulpit. I had 11 minutes to uh, 11, 11 to try to hurry and do a sermon. And they've given me 37 minutes today. No, I'm just, no, we're going to move on. Okay, so, all right. all right. Whatever happens to the music. So we're continuing on in our uh, reading of the book of Acts. We're getting close to the end of chapter 24. I just started writing chapter 27, verse 1. So I'm nearly to the end of this monumental book of the early church and let's watch the video real quick when the governor motioned for him to speak paul replied i know that for a number of years you have been a judge over this nation so i gladly make my defense you can easily verify that no more than 12 days ago i went up to jerusalem to worship my accusers did not find me arguing with anyone at the temple or stirring up a crowd in the synagogues or anywhere else in the city. And they cannot prove to you the charges they are now making against me. However, I admit that I worship the God of our fathers as a follower of the way, which they call a sect. I believe everything that agrees with the law and that is written in the prophets, and I have the same hope in God as these men that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So, I strive always to keep my conscience clear before God and man. After an absence of several years, I came to Jerusalem to bring my people gifts for the poor and to present offerings. I was ceremonially clean when they found me in the temple courts doing this. There was no crowd with me, nor was I involved in any disturbance. But there are some Jews from the province of Asia who ought to be here before you and bring charges if they have anything against me. Or these who are here should state what crime they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Unless it was this one thing I shouted as I stood in their presence. It is concerning the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial before you today. And then Paul, after the governor had nodded to him to go ahead and speak, answered, Inasmuch as I know you, Marcus Antonius Felix, have been for many years a Roman judge of the nation. I do the more cheerfully answer for myself, because you may ascertain that it has been no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone, nor inciting any crowd, either in the synagogue or in the city, nor can they prove the things of which they now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I have worshipped the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection from the dead, both of the just and the unjust. This being so, I myself always strive to have a conscience, a good conscience, without offense between toward God and men. Now, after many years, I came to bring alms and offerings back to my nation, in the midst of which some Jews from Asia Minor found me purifying myself in the temple. Neither was I with a mob nor with a Talmud. They ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me. 
Or else let those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me. While I stood before the council, unless it is for this one statement, which I testified to, crying aloud, standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, for which I am now being judged by you, Governor, this very day. So there's Paul's defense of this. Last week we looked at the clever cunningness of the um, Tertullus, the orator, procurator of the Jewish Sanhedrin, and how they were painting the picture of Paul being an insurrectionist, a terrorist, and many other things. So Paul gives his defense. Let's take a look at it and break this down. First, we're going to review. So for review, how many days has it been since the time of Paul's arrival in the city of Jerusalem, way back there in chapter 21? That's right, the three chapters we've been discussing, four chapters now almost, the same concept, his coming back to Jerusalem and his arrest. So how long has it been since he has come there now to the governor? A total of 19 days. He's been with the governor three of 12, and there's seven before it. Remember the purification, we're going to get to that. So let's recall it all. Day one, Paul arrives in Jerusalem, and he is living at the house of one of the oldest followers of the way, Manasseh, who is from the island of Cyprus. Go back and we can review that in the scripture there in Acts 21. Paul meets with the council of the Jerusalem church and James, the brother of Jesus, the very next day he's brought in to talk to the apostles and the elders of the church council. Day three through nine, Paul takes four other men, pays their way, and becomes part of a purification vow of a Nazarite vow for seven days to prove that he is what? On the Jewish side. So we're going to stop here for one second. The thinking was what? Try to appease those who are against us by showing that you're not doing anything apart from the Holy Scripture. Or try to show as much as you can that you're part of the in-group or the group in power. Okay. Much like today, if you try that, here's what ends up happening. You usually have to join that. Okay. So Paul was like, okay, well, I'll do that, but I don't know that it'll help. Who remembers that? But willingly, to have a good conscience, he did it anyway. Day 10 through 12. The uprising occurs because they go there and they remove him. The only real Talmud, the only real uprising is them trying to murder Paul, not Paul trying to cause a problem, remember? Sounds familiar today, right? Anybody who's on the inside of what the government now believes can do whatever they want, and there's no consequences. Anyone who does the right thing gets thrown in jail and said they did something wrong. Sound familiar? And so Paul is then kept in the barracks. Who remembers? Right? Lysias, the Tribune commander, says, i got to protect his life. i got to get to the bottom of this. I'm going to call in the Sanhedrin. We're going to have a council here in the Roman barracks where I can control the situation. Day 13 to 14 is our forced two-day overnight road march. Who remembers that? Remember the op ward? Okay, we went through all that. And off to Caesarea. Day 15 to day 19, Paul is kept in Herod's Praetorium, now five days, awaiting the trial that he's now actually in that we're hearing this morning. So a total of 19 days. So the Bible took chapter 21, 22, 23, and 24, and still not done, we're going to go to 25, on the same trial, okay? So when you're reading that in the book of Acts, realize that's 19 days in those five chapters. All right, recall the strategy of the Sanhedrin Council accusations and the debate tactics used by their orator, Tertullus. This is from last week. We're going to review. So the first thing you do is flatter, flatter, flatter the people you want to impress if you're trying to do things the way of the world, right? Remember? Oh, how wonderful you are, Marcus Antonius Felix. We couldn't do without you. <laughs> then what did he do? He, f he gave three negative an an anarchist, insurrectionist, and terror terror terrorist pejoratives, okay? He's an, he's, an an you know, he's an anarchist. He's an insurrectionist. He's a terrorist. We can prove all this, right? You ever notice that most of the things that people are still sitting in prison for in our modern day, they're, they're declared to be what? One of those three things. Who knows what I'm talking about? People still sitting there on January 6th in, in prison today are called one of those three things or all of them. And recently, our 45th president has been called all of them. And the minute one indictment is removed, another indictment is brought. Now, 
Just in case you think I am trying to say that Paul and Donald Trump are alike, you're wrong. <laughs> See, you can be right and not do it for the right reasons and also be persecuted. Who knows what I'm talking about now? See, I just wish that Donald Trump really did have a real faith. I really do. Then the man would be persecuted for all the right, what? Reasons. But unfortunately, from the perspective of Satan and the dominion of evil that's now in control of most of the world and ga gaining control every day, they only care about one thing, stopping truth no matter how they can do it. Whether that be secular, whether that be in, 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 in the in the uh, financial markets, whether that be in the government, whether that be in the churches. He wants to silence any voice, no matter what, speaking what? Truth. Because if people have truth, they can do what? Make informative decisions to do the right thing. Right? So that's where we are today. So think about that as we're going through this. So they frame the defendant's character as evil. Remember what Paul said? In the last days, they'll say that evil is good and good is... Mm -hmm. A real fascinating thing you could check out here is the parallels between Paul's trial and Dietrich Bonhoeffer's in Germany. There would be a real interesting parallel of two theologians. You should check it out sometime. Uh, one of my favorite books of his is Letters from Cell 9, 926. You got to read the letters he wrote that an SS guard got out for him who was actually playing the uh, double role of a guard, followed by the use of three positive attempts to, to lawfully control the situation. Hey, we had it all under control. The church and the government are one and the same. If you just would have left us alone, we could have taken care of this, Paul, but you interfered with the military. Now we have no choice but to let you handle it. Again, this is how, they, how the debatist brought this thing, the lawyer brought this to trial. And then finally, everybody agrees that it's the truth, even though everybody knows it's not the truth. And so majority rules. Well, everybody said it happened. It must have. Boy, we don't see that today, do we? Even though in right in front of your eyes, it didn't happen. Right? So there's our, there's our arguments against Paul. Now let's look at what Paul's defense looks like. All right, Paul, Paul, then Paul, after the governor had nodded for him to speak, starts in. Inasmuch as I know who you are, and the position you have held for several years in our community, I now tell you what happened on a day-by-day -day basis. So Paul doesn't try any of these fancy tactics. Matter of fact, he doesn't say anything good about him being a Roman judge. He just states the facts. You are the judge. Okay? This is the equivalent of going into court and saying, Your Honor. Remember when you used to have to say that? Sometimes I go down to the Flemington Courthouse and I sit there and I listen to just court cases. I know it's weird. <laughs> but they get up and they say, hey, dude. Now, uh, in my day, okay, <laughs> our, most of our days here, if you'd have said that to a judge, what would have happened? Uh, <clears throat> they hardly ever correct the people. There's been a few times I've had to say something good on behalf of someone who's trying to better their life, even though they were doing something wrong, and now they're making an attempt to get back into society. And they'll say, Reverend, do you have any words about this person that you've been counseled? And I will say, yes, Your Honor. May I stand in your presence and speak? You should see the courtroom stop. And then everybody turns and looks at you. And everybody says, like uh, one, guy, one guy next to me when I sat down said, you know you don't have to do that anymore, don't you? I said, uh, you know when you stand before Christ, you better say yes, sir. Uh, anyway, right. the Sanhedrin's council, okay, four accusations. What were they? Let's go back. He is a plague. And that plague is broken down into different parts of that thing. Uh, what he really is is a creator of dissension. Okay, another word for it. Where? Everywhere. He doesn't just do it here in Jerusalem. He doesn't just do it here in Israel. He does it everywhere out in the Roman world, in the greater world. He's a ringleader, you know, somebody who's trying to overthrow our way of life and the government or whatever else. And he profanes that which is holy. That's their arguments. You can go back and look at them. All right. All right, Paul's defense. Let's take a look at what he does. He focuses on their lack of that used to matter. Who remembers when that used to matter? 
Like if you didn't have a real eyewitness and you really didn't have the smoking gun, nobody's what? Nobody's guilty. Nowadays, well, you're guilty. Yep, yep, he's guilty. Why? Look at his, look at his affiliation. He's guilty. All right? So every accusation he tears apart. He does it very craftily, by the way. Very good debater. Paul must have been incredible to listen to. They neither found me in the temple creating dissension. See, look, he goes right to the first argument. What was the big thing? I was a dissenter causing dissension. They never found me doing that. They found me purifying myself according to the law. Quietly. I didn't even speak. I wasn't allowed to. It was a time of seven days of quietness. Okay. I wasn't inciting the crowd. Their crowd was inciting me. Okay. The opposite of everything you'd heard. Nor can they prove anything that I'm about to talk about next. They have no evidence for anything. So this I confess to you, though. Now, here's the real truth, Governor. I do follow the way. Now, by this time, there was two words for Christianity. The people of the way and the Nazarenes. Okay? That's all there was. And they either followed Jesus of Nazareth, right, for which they were called Nazarenes, or they followed the way, which was a narrow way still in Judaism, accepting who as Messiah? Christ. Okay? While others still disputed it or didn't. So he's saying, now, just, just so you I know you've heard these terms because people have come before you before. You're a very smart man. I'm one of those. I'm a Christian. Okay? But I still worship God, my Father, believing everything that was ever written. Now, how do I know that? Whenever someone says all of the law and all of the prophets, they mean the first 39 books or the Old Testament of the entire Bible. See? He says, yeah, I read the Nephubim and the Kephubim, and yes, I, I'm a Jew. I studied them all. They don't, they don't divide their Bible like we do. Okay? So bottom line is everything that's ever been written before this Christ I'm a Jew. So it goes right to the heart of the matter. And he realizes he's talking to Pharisees and Sadducees, teachers of the Jewish law. What are they going to say? He doesn't? They caught me doing what? Purifying myself according to the law. They, what are they going to say? I wasn't? So Paul's defense, his debate strategy now focuses on what they, as the religious authorities, have conveniently left out. Now, this is exactly what we see today. They only talk about what they want to talk about. The minute you corner them on anything they don't want to talk about, they go to, they go to commercial. Who knows what I'm talking about? They just conveniently change the subject, right? But, 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 but we, we got documents showing that you lied in the documents. So what? Who knows what I'm talking about? Like, there should be hundreds of people in jail right now. The conspiracy that's happening in our time. And no one is going anywhere. As a matter of fact, the very people who lied are now bringing new accusations against the person that they did in the first place, and they're allowed to still be lawyers. Do you remember when lawyers got disbarred? Right? Lost their license? And it's interesting. Anyway, all right. So they've left out a lot. So what they don't want Paul to do right now is speak, but he's been given open audience to say whatever he wants. So now he's going to fill in the blanks. Did you know, governor, you're not a Jew, you're a Roman. Did, did, did you know that in the church, the, the Pharisees believe in a resurrection and the Sadducees don't? Did you know? So, so he starts going into this. Remember, Luke is giving us a condensed version of the whole proceeding. He's not telling us every little tidbit. But you can imagine Paul, right, going on for hours. Now, let me tell you what resurrection means. Now, let me tell you what no resurrection means. Now, let me tell you... And you can see those Sadducees and Pharisees in that little inner circle trying to convict him, going, shut up, shut up, because what's coming out? The truth. And now, where's the real conflict? With each other. That's what they had over Jesus. Who remembers? The Sadducees had him killed, and the Pharisees went along with it just because they wanted to stay in power. But it's all about concerning one thing, the resurrection from the dead. See, and people say to me all the time, well, you can talk about God in our society. No one says anything. That's true. As long as God is whatever you want God to be. But the minute you make God a person who came to earth, Jesus of Nazareth, and the minute you make him the only son of God and the only way to salvation and the only one who will judge you, 
because he died for you and rose from the dead and now awaits in the ascension for you. The minute you claim that, you've got a firestorm. See? So what does Paul say? I'll tell you where the firestorm is. I'll just make it easy for you since you're a Roman. Resurrection from the dead of God's only son. I love Paul. Cut to the chase, my father used to say. Who remembers that one? Oh, come on, pastor. Just get this over so we can go home. But then he does something that Christ would have done. Both the just and the unjust shall stand before the throne of judgment. Oh, boy. Oh, fire and brimstone. I used to love those sermons. How about you? Huh? Yeah, you little dirt bags. I'm a dirt bag. You're a dirt bag. And without Christ, we're dirt bags. I'm just going to sum it up easy. And we're all going to stand there. And I, there's so many pastors today saying that we're, we're Christians. We're going to bypass the judgment seat. No, you're not. And don't let any pastor tell you you are. You'll be forgiven for one thing and one thing only, the blood of Christ that covers you. But you'll still be on trial because you and I do not do anything right even in one day. Trust me, some thought enters your mind at some point, right? Okay, I'll give you a classic example. The four, the four grandchildren running around the house. Everything is going well. I mean, we were into the 18th hour of the day and they hadn't done anything wrong. And I was like, could this be it? <laughs> I, could we have a perfect day? And we were telling them how good they were doing. And we were thinking, wow, we're winning. I went to the bathroom. Just a number one. True minutes for a man. Tops. And I hear this. Ah! And your backbone just kind of jerks. Your parents, grandparents, you know that feeling? Oh, I've got to go in there and I've got to do something about this. And my daughter said, really? Because she was kind of hoping things were going to go. And what it is is that one person had taken somebody else's something just two minutes before reading the Bible and going to bed. All right. All my point is is that we are always in need of forgiveness, even when we do our very best, right? And isn't it wonderful that God's there for us? Amen. But we're all going to be there. And, and this, you can just see, right, the evil of these men, the devil inside of them. That's what they are. Don't kid yourself. What does it say about Judas Iscariot when he left the, uh, the table and Satan entered him? Yeah, don't, 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 don't give these guys any credit. They know what they're doing. You're going to face judgment right alongside of me. And the only reason I'm going to be forgiven is I got knocked off my horse and I got it right. You still can while there's still time. He is the Savior of the world. Say amen. Don't you just love Paul? But I'm telling you this because I strive for something. And we should all strive for this. This is the greatest, one of the greatest lines of Paul's writing. We should all strive to have a good conscience before everybody. Amen. What does Paul say later? If you do that, then when they speak evil of you, they're actually going to cast what on their, own, on their own head? Burning hot coals. Right? Let them say that about you because there's nothing they can bring. This is why I wish Donald J. Trump and people like him had a real faith. Because if he did, you know where he could, he could really stand on what? Righteous ground, couldn't he? Wouldn't that be cool? Let's start praying for God to raise up people, even if they don't even get into the positions, that will just speak the truth, amen? And then live by it. Remember the real characters? Right? So Paul's defense now focuses on putting the inner circle who's accusing him, right, within the actual events in chronological order. Wow, this is, this is always good to do in court. Can, can we get the chronology right of the story? Now, after many years, he might even have said five here, according to, the, according to the thing. I finally came back to Jerusalem. He hasn't been there in a long time. Where has he been on all these missionary journeys? Where? 
all across the Greek peninsula, all across what's now modern day Turkey, he, he, you know, Bulgaria, Armenia, I mean, I'm sorry, Albania, what would be Albania today? He, he's just been everywhere. Okay, he hasn't been home in a long, long time. He's gone back to Antioch a few times, who remembers? To Syria, but he hasn't really gone home. This is his fifth journey home after five years. He's finally coming home, and, he's, and they're, already, they're, out, they're out to kill him before he even gets to the city. This is kind of like going to a university or college today, being a conservative and trying to talk. Who knows what I'm talking about now? They just get up, and they talk, 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 and yell, yell, yell until you shut up and go home. No freedom of speech on our campuses. There isn't any. If you think there is, you should go, to, you should go, go listen to a conservative speak at Rutgers. Okay? So... There was none of this. They're lying. I didn't stir anything. I was silent like I was, watch this. I was silent like a lamb before the shearer. Who knows what I'm talking about now? It, he, he was silent and opened not his mouth. That's, that's how they found Paul, just like who? Jesus before who? Pilate. Isn't that interesting, the parallels here? Now he, he switches a little bit more. Those responsible for his captivity and his trial that he's facing right now and all the ones he's had before, they have not proved any accusation. They've never given you one ounce of absolute proof. They, the Jews from Asia, ought to be here. Now, why aren't they there? Let's see if anybody listens to my sermons week after week, okay? This is what a pastor likes to find out. Why aren't those 40 Asian minor Asian Jews, men, why aren't they at this trial? Oh, boy. Oh yeah. What were they going to do when Paul showed up at the second meeting with Lysias in the, they were going to kill him. Who remembers? They stopped eating, they took a vow of fasting, and they were going to murder him on the way. Remember the forced road march at night with nobody around? Remember the nephew coming? You know who should be here? The murderers, the conspirators, Ray Epps. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that, that's another, if you don't know what that is, just look up Ray Epps. Okay. Uh, the, the real people behind the real, that's a joke. It's funny if you know what I'm talking about. Who is Ray Epps? Um, so they, the Jews, ought to be here. If they really had something against me, they'd be here. Instead, instead, they're nowhere to be found. Why? Because you know that they were actually conspirators because of Lysis, and you'd put them in prison for what? Conspiracy to commit what? How many people, when you read your Bible, get all this out of it, by the way? Isn't this awesome? This is just awesome. The word of God is just incredible, isn't it? All right. Or else, okay, since they're not here, since Antifa's not here, <laughs> let those... Let those taking the handouts from the Roman government and the underhanded deals, the inner circle of our church, let them say what I did wrong. Tell Tertullus to sit down and quit being the mouthpiece and let's hear from the high priest. Let's hear from the real people. Now, he focuses finally on the main point of the contention. The difference between Judaism and the whole world today and Christianity today. Now, who knows what I'm talking about? What's the real difference between Jews today, who are not Messianic Jews, and real Christians? The belief in what? Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, Redeemer of all of mankind. Son of man, Son of God. There's the real issue. What does Paul say? That the veil would be lifted, the veil of Moses, before he returns, that my own countrymen would return to Christ, right? Remember the fond prayers? I'd be cut off if all of them would be saved. Can you imagine wanting to go to hell forever to save everybody else? Now there's a heart set free. The real, the real crux of everything we're doing is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because if Jesus died and he wasn't raised, we're to be what? According to Paul. The most pitied of all religions, for nothing we believe is of any value. He died on a bloodless stick, a martyr for nothing. And there's no hope in what? everlasting life. But if Christ is raised, and he has been, Paul says, then what is ours? The sky, the new heavens, the new earth, fellowship, eternity, love, peace, 
rest. Doesn't that sound good? Doesn't rest just sound good? How many people just like one day just to say, for 24 hours, nothing go wrong, nobody bother me, nobody call me. No job calls. The other day I was with someone eating, um, Scott Fry actually, the guitarist from Pennsylvania. We were over having breakfast and I turned off my phone, turned it completely, not even the vibrate. He said, do you do that? <laughs> I said, if I want to talk to you, Scott, for an hour, I, you know, if someone dies, what am I going to do? <laughs> for an hour, what, for an hour, what am I going to do? And, 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 you know, well, our talks are more like two hours, but, but when you go out there and you tell people, that Christ is who he is? What do you tell them? He died for me and he rose again and he's praying for me now and he's praying for you and we're all going. Don't you? Think about how you tell the gospel, right? What's the central hope though? The resurrection of the dead. Christ defeated sin on the cross, but he defeated death once and for all. The final victory, Paul says, is over what? death. Where is your sting? Remember in Corinthians? Huh? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paraphrase it. When the grave robber comes at midnight. Right? You ever think of Jesus as a grave robber? He is. The biggest one of all. Can you imagine when they're all open? Who wants to get robbed? <laughs> Come on, it's a joke. Who wants to get robbed? Amen? Where do you want to go? I want him to steal my soul out of the clutches of who? Amen. Don't you? Can you just see Paul? I just, I could just see him. He's so much more brilliant than I would be a hundred times over, just nailing it on the, t unless it is for this one thing. Christ is who he is and always shall be. Amen. Amen. And again, I say, what a guy. He just signed his own death's warrant. Amen. And then I was, I was writing this. And you know what the thought came to me? When Jesus came in at night and told him that he would go to Rome and preach even higher, you know what I'm thinking? He's thinking, push the buttons. Let's go to Rome. I, I get Paul. I'm like him. I wonder what will happen if I turn the screw one more quarter turn. And sometimes I just do it to watch. Where did that come from? You know, some, some feminist is right in my face. And, you know, in Titus it says you're supposed to follow men. <laughs> and then I say to him, where does that spirit come from? Why are you so angry? Right? I can just see Paul. Hey, if I push one more button, they're going to send me where? To Rome. What did he do? He's appealing to who? The, the head honcho. And he's a Roman citizen, so he can do it. He wants to go to the Supreme Court. Paul now knows that this is the argument of arguments. And they've hardened their heart against God. He's given them one last chance to receive the gospel of peace. You see it? What a love, huh? You want to kill me, and all I want to do is save you. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they remember. Wow, is this Jesus or what? So here's Paul's new mindset, and we're done. And by the way, I'm still under 11 o'clock. I'm doing pretty good. Maybe I should slow down. All right. People always say, you go too fast. I really want you to concentrate on these next two slides. Okay? What's Paul's new mindset? It's focused. After all these years of knowing Christ, and he has become sweeter the longer he knows him. Remember that song? We just sang it. Paul plans out his future in order to set up more opportunities to do what in Rome and, and across the globe? To proclaim to more people what? The gospel message of what? Forgiveness and grace and peace with God. No more war, no more enmity. He preaches it to the Gentiles, the Romans, the soldiers, the officials, all those pagan religions of the world. All of it is untrue. Let me tell you the one true thing. Christ came. Christ led a perfect life. Christ died. Christ rose. Christ ascended. 
And Christ is praying now for us until he comes for us again in glory. Just to say those words and mean it with all of his heart. He does all of this. There's no more holding back. He says, I am being burnt out. Remember to the Corinthian people at both ends like a candle. People accuse me of that all the time. Pastor, when are you going to slow down? Are you going to have a heart attack or a stroke? When I do, I do. Don't worry about me. That's good, okay? That means I get to go home. In the meantime, I'm not going to let any moss grow under my feet, and you're not either, amen? Burn it up. You only get one shot, right? All right. That's his mindset. Now, therefore, what should ours be? People always say, Pastor, what do I do with the message you just gave me? Read it silently, and then I'll talk. I'm going to say something to you. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to catch me. Why do we answer for the sake of the call? Keep your eyes closed. Why do we do what we do? Because he has made us worthy for the sake of the call. And for the sake of the call, I will abandon it all to be found worthy simply because of he who has called. Open your eyes. Did you hear that? Did you feel it? Does it make sense? People say to me, why would you stop wanting to be a doctor and make hundreds of thousands of dollars a year and be secure? I couldn't. Why did you stop being in the military when all you had to do was just kind of nod to Christ and no one would know differently and you could have a beautiful pension right now at age 58 because they told me I had to compromise what I truly believe and I will not it's the same mind that was in Christ it's the same mind that was in Peter and Paul and John it's the mind that ought to be ours according to Philippians I will abandon it all for the sake of the call. That's why we do what we do. That's why we take calls at Jeep when people complain about the cost of air conditioning and whatever else it is. And we have a good conscience. Sometimes I think of that, Mike. I think of the day you're having because I know how people are. It's fun. But it is a struggle, right? It is. We do what we do because we want to see one thing. their smiling faces on judgment day. We do what we do because we want to rejoice with them that they have been given the right with us to be sons and daughters of the Most High. We do what we do so we can praise with our opposition one day because they've accepted Christ and they're crying out louder than we are, worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb. Amen? Let's literally make this a battle plan. Look what I said there. Let's perfect, look at the yellow. Purposely seek out and purposely set up opportunity. I'm going to start teaching this in the fall, how to do that, okay? And, you know, somebody will tell me about a conversation they had, and they said, I just didn't know how to turn that. And I'll turn to them and said, say it again. And then I'll, I'll parrot a line that could be added right there, and it would then turn into what? Okay? And I'm not doing it to be superior. I'm doing it to show the person all you got to do is just think about one little switch of the conversation and boom, we're off and running. Okay, We're off and running. And that's the key. And how many people find that to be the hardest thing in the world to do? Come on, be honest. That little line, what is it? What do I say? Why do I say it? Right? And you know what it comes from? It doesn't come from superior intellect. It doesn't come from study. Like, you know, like a math test. It comes from from asking God to change your heart and your mind over and over and over and over. Honestly, it does. And you know what it requires? To enter into someone's pain. And you know what we're afraid of? Any more of that. I got enough, thank you. Come on, be honest. Right? But really, when someone's really hurting and they're really in your face about God or about something else, you know what it really is? Unbridled passion of pain. 
and suffering. And you know what you got to do? You got to do what Paul says. Peter, I have to enter into suffering with them. And I find, I find a mystery there, that when I do, I really hear them. I really understand them. And even though it breaks me, I find the opening. That's where it lies. That's the secret to setting up these situations. Let me tell you what you got to do before you do that. You have to pray to want to do the suffering. You know, and, and people say, wow, pastor, you know, you make Christianity so hard. No, it's just the way it is. This is the truth, okay? The truth is you have to want that soul so desperately that your love for them becomes the love of Christ for them. And what did he do for us? Suffered on a regular basis. As a matter of fact, there's some times where I think he did this. Right? Who is this that the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this? We're all going to drown. Where's your faith? I mean, these guys were with him the whole time, right? Think about it. It's, it's, that's, that's human nature. Can you imagine Jesus? I mean, sometimes he must have done face plants. Let's be honest. Really? Like, and he says to Philip at the end, right, at the, at the Last Supper, how long will I be with you? But you know what it was? They hadn't got over, they hadn't got over the easy stuff. They hadn't asked for the harder stuff. And you know what he said? I have prayed for you. I'll just use Peter for an example. Satan wants to sift you like wheat. You know why? Because if you start doing what I ask, you'll shake the foundations of hell and souls will fall out. Amen? Let's be the sifters of men's hearts as we get in the trench with them. Suffer with them. And glean souls. That's our only job. There isn't another one. I have come to seek and to save that which was what? And what else? To serve, and that might mean suffering, and not to be served or even heard. There are times that has to go away for the sake of another. Let's make that our ultimate prayer from here on out. Let's have the same mindset that was in Christ and the same mindset who was in what? Paul. A heart truly set free. Let us conclude our time together with this old hymn that just talks about the change that happened to us since he came into our hearts. Shall we rise before we dismiss? Wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have light in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Let such joy or my soul. Like the sea billows run since Jesus came into my heart. I have ceased from my wandering, going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into came into my heart let the joy or my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart I'm 
possessed of a hope that is steadfast and sure since Jesus came into my heart. And no dark clouds of doubt, now my pathway obscure since Jesus came into Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Please, just please be seated for one more minute and we're done. We're really used to having benedictions here in the church. You may be seated. Where we do the one-liners and we're gone. Those are great. But I really feel like this piece of scripture is what we should end with today. Okay, I just impressed upon it as we were singing. Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, if there is any fellowship in the Holy Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion, then make my joy complete by being of that same mind, maintaining that same love, united in one spirit, intent on one purpose alone. Do nothing from your own selfishness or your own empty conceit. But with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interest, but for the interest of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also found in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed forever in the form of God, did not require, did not regard his equality with God something to be grasped. Instead, he emptied himself, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of you and I. He was found in the appearance of a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to everything the Father wanted, even to the point of his own death, even to death on a cross. And for this reason, then, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, those who are in heaven, those who are on the earth, and those who are under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved brothers and sisters, Paul writes, just as you have always obeyed so far, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence written to me, that you work out your salvation every day in fear and trembling. For it is God who is at work both in you and in I, both to will and to work for his very good will and pleasure. Do all things, therefore, without grumbling or without disputing so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent and true children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you live. Appear as lights in this world of darkness. Hold fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I will have reason to glory with you, because I did not run in vain or toil in vain among you. But even if I, being poured out like a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of the faith, I rejoice and I share my joy with you always. So to you, I urge you, rejoice in the very same way as you have seen me do, so that our joy may be complete. To God be the glory. Go and serve him this week. Amen.
that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy, a song where I go since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into Since Jesus came into my heart, we made it. Thanks, everybody. Thank Thanks you. Everybody.